Okay, we're back. We're live here on a given Wednesday with Energy in America and Lou Puglierisi, who is now back from his travels, uh, you know, in Dubai. He's back in Washington, and he can speak to us now from uh, the comfort of Washington, D.C. Hi, Lou. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, Jay. It's good to be home. So we're going to talk today about methane, methane in America, methane in the energy mix, if you will, in America, how we got yeah. it uh, and what we do with it and how it affects climate change, all those things right here on ThinkTech. Okay, Lou, what is methane? How does it fit? So methane is actually uh, uh, another term for the uh, chemical makeup of uh, natural gas, right? So uh, methane exists in the natural form. We'll see some tables on that in the United States. It is a very powerful a greenhouse gas, uh, uh, according to... Uh, the folks that work on climate issues, but uh, it has a, and so it has a, some leverage over CO2. On the other hand, it's much more short lived than CO2. It doesn't remain in the atmosphere as long. What happens to um, it? Uh, it, it uh, kind of breaks down into some form of uh, CO2 and uh, other, other uh, components mm -hmm. over time. So which one is a greater uh, threat to climate change? I mean, people say that well, uh, think, as bad as CO2 is, methane's worse. Is that true? Well, what do you think the total percentage of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere? Do you have any idea? No, I don't, but I feel what I'm going to know very soon. Within this half hour, I'm going to know. Yes. 0.04%. Okay. So the atmosphere only has 0.04% of carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. It has a much, much less percentage of methane. So um, I'm not saying that that is not enough to have an effect on the climate, but I'm just saying uh, you need to put it kind of in perspective. And uh -huh. so, uh, and uh, I, I don't think, you know, we want to talk about climate models today on this particular program. I mean, we, the basic assumption is we'll operate that, uh, Man has contributed to change in the climate, that uh, CO2 and methane are part of the, uh, you know, part of the phenomena of man's involvement, anthropogenic or man-made uh, emissions are contributing to the changing climate. And we should just leave it at that for now. We could have a longer discussion of that at some point on the, what the debate is, but uh, I usually find that's a kind of difficult discussion to have with people. People have sort of made up their minds. But I do think there is a very big issue on, okay, lots of people agree that man is affecting the climate, but there's widespread disagreement even among scientists on what is the magnitude of that uh, damage function, if you like. But, well, we look at Florida um, yeah. and tell you in a couple of days. So uh, I just got a book from uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Pelkey which examines the history of weather and hurricanes over the last hundred years. And the Pelkey Research, who is a member of the IPCC, a very prominent uh, climatologist, who says the data does not support uh, that uh, storms are more frequent or intense <laughs> from climate change. Climate change can do lots of bad things, but it's not showing up in the data and intensity of storms or the frequency. <laughs> Part of the problem with storms is that, uh, and I used to fly with the hurricane hunters, I know a little bit about this, this was a long time ago, is that you need to adjust the damage calculations for the fact that many years ago, our storms used to land in the US and islands, but nobody was living there. Now people are living in many of the places that are subject to storm damage, including more people on the coast. So. It's not just a kind of anecdotal, oh, I saw this storm and it did a lot of damage. There must be a terrible climate catastrophe in the works. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. But uh, the, because climate, climate discussions are more emotional than fact-based or more emotional than kind of thought-based, I think there's not a lot you can do about how the public or some people in the public feel about it. Well, I think a lot of but people, a lot of people looking at these storms, and there's a lot of them lately, and they're really killer I'm just storms. Saying, 
Yeah, you can say that. You can say all of that, right? We had we the whole city of Galveston went under underwater over 120 years ago. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of storms. We always had a lot of storms. I mean, at some point you have to look at the data. I'm most happy to do a whole program on this if you would like. Okay. But the, I'm the making a note of that. Not, <laughs> We're going to do a data, program. The data on does that. not support that the frequency or intensity of storms are more common now than they were over the last 200 years. It just doesn't, it's not supported by the data. Okay. It's All just right. like fires in California. It's the same thing. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about yeah. methane then. So I think the reason we're talking about this is there's been a lot of reports in the press that the Trump administration has now permitted large amounts of methane to go in the atmosphere because they won't regulate it, right? I mean, I think that's the kind of tagline from the press. And I think it's more important to dig behind it and see what the real debate is. It. And part of the debate is uh, the way we regulate uh, pollutants in the United States or criteria pollutants of with methane is not one. In fact, the EPA under the Clean Air Act has a requirement to regulate volatile organic co uh, compounds, or, uh, and uh, but not uh, methane. Methane is not a criteria pollutant. However, under the endangerment finding of the Supreme Court, they're able to do that for new sources and some existing sources. So maybe we should just look and see how methane fits into our whole environmental uh, you know, loadings of, of uh, climate uh, climate gases, and then talk a little bit about what we ought to do about it, and what makes sense. I think that's the best way to get started. Okay, great. Yeah, very interested in yeah, that. So what, let, let, let's get a little fix on first, um, the, our first uh, picture here on what's happening to, to power generation by fuel type. Okay, so I think one of the interesting, if we, if we look at this particular uh, chart, it shows you the makeup of the U.S. power sector in terms of the fuels, right? So this is the, the power we get our electricity from. And you can see in the blue line that coal is declining as a percentage of our power generation, right? Mm -hmm. That in the green line, so-called non-carbon generation, which includes nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar, is growing. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, the other issue is the rapid growth in natural gas. So any discussion about methane has to also understand that the that you know methane leaks or methane. Uh, the general concern when you talk about methane is that when you produce and ship natural gas, some of it leaks into the atmosphere. Right? Some of it leaks if you have bad. Although there's a lot of incentives to not leak it because it's worth money. Um, some of it can leak into the atmosphere. That's a natural consequence of a rapid expansion of natural gas production. But a rapid expansion of natural gas production means we are using much less coal. Mm -hmm. so, so let me let me let me ask as a footnote point. What is methane used for in, in industry, uh, in energy? What no, what, what, what they use it for? Methane. Methane is, don't confuse it with methanol. Methane is another name for natural gas, uncombusted natural gas. Mm -hmm. okay. It is the chemical makeup of natural gas. So when someone says methane, they're just talking about uncombusted natural gas. Okay. But the, but the, so, uh, the, the, uh, it would appear in the same place on the periodic table of elements and all that. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It's, uh, okay. Well, it's made up of elements of the periodic table. But yes, right. Yes, thank you. C four, C two. Okay. So, so the question is, how has the industry done generally in containing these leaks of uncombusted metal, uh, of uh, methane or natural gas? And keep in mind, when you see these big uh, operations which they are flaring natural gas, mm -hmm. that's not methane. That's CO two. Mm -hmm. If you ignite the methane or the natural gas, it turns into CO2 and mm -hmm. lots of other things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's the important thing. So if we go to the next the next table here, the next figure, uh, I think it's important to take a look here. What's been happening to changes in U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide 
over the last 10 years, you see. And you can see here by this chart, if you look at it, you can see the pink is coal, the somewhat uh, darker, you know, the red, the red, or sorry, if you like, the reddish pink is natural gas. And uh, petroleum or, you know, crude oil, if you like, would be the dark figure. Mm -hmm. And I think what this shows is that uh, U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide emissions have been going up and down, but largely they have been going down. So they have been declining, looks get a little better. They do vary from year to year, um, but as more uh, natural gas enters the energy stream or the energy complex at less coal, the U.S. on net is reducing its uh, CO2 uh, emissions. And uh, let's go to when the next chart. you say emissions, you mean emissions from... Um, vehicles, emissions from power plants? Oh, no, 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 no. there's very little uh, in this case here. Yeah, so this, of course, the petroleum would be the emissions from vehicles. Mm -hmm. So this particular chart was a whole, a whole economy-wide estimate. But um, the emissions of carbon dioxide from the U.S. economy from the energy portion of the U.S. economy. I'm not talking about the cows and the people eating hamburgers and all this other stuff, or the people breathing, is that um, is, is shown a reduction because, largely in the U.S. because natural gas is replacing coal. Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of net, net number that a lot of people don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. That is why the U.S. is one of the even though our per capita emissions are high, we're a wealthy country, we use a lot of energy, our reductions over the last 10 years are better than any other industrial country and, and better than any other country. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is the leader in reducing its emissions over the last 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I'll, uh, let's go to the uh, next chart. And you can see that on a little more, on a more clear uh, sort of view. So this shows you U.S. Uh, energy-related carbon dioxide emission, emissions in the U.S. from 1998 to 2018. And I would presume most people in the U.S., probably most people in the Hawaiian Islands, would find this chart kind of surprising, right? I mean, if you look at this chart, going back to 1998, the U.S. has actually been reducing its carbon dioxide emissions, right? We have a little bump in 2018, but I believe the early data from 2019 show a decline. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a kind of a remarkable achievement in many ways. But mm -hmm. And that achievement is much more related to the fracking revolution than any policies uh, good for the climate or bad for the climate implemented by either President Obama or President Trump. This is just a matter of better technology and fracking, eh? Yeah, it's just a matter of, of gas backing out coal. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. right? It's not dominated by wind and solar. We're not producing enough wind and solar to you know, really move the meter substantially on emissions. It's really, when you back out coal, you back out a lot of carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. even though you're replacing it with another fossil fuel. But so that within... fossil fuel... Within the um, th that part of the, can we go back to that chart for a minute? Within the yeah. um, the blue part, or the, make that the green part, the natural gas part. Do we know you how much gas. how much of that natural gas is methane, or should be cl considered methane? Um, all of that natural gas is methane. Do we know how much of that natural gas is leaking into the environment? Right. Right. And we do. We do have a Emissions. series of studies. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we do have a series of studies by EPA. There's some debate over how accurate those studies are, but we're talking anywhere from one to one and a half percent of the total production of natural gas uh, leaking into the environment. Right. Although the remarkable thing is, even though natural gas production has expanded by you know, an enormous amount. I think the uh, methane emission levels from the say from 
gas venting and flaring uh, have declined about 17% over from 2013 to 2016, even as domestic productions increased by over 20%. So they're, they're getting better at it. And I think uh, if you look at uh, methane emissions from hydraulic fractured well completions, they declined 82% between 2013 and 2016. With all of that, why, you know, why did uh, the president, uh, why is he trying to uh, loosen the rules? Uh, well, the president did not. Okay, so the question is, there are two kinds of the regulation effects, something called new sources and existing sources. And there's several reasons for this. One is, um, the uh, states do their own their own programs for controlling like texas pennsylvania ohio california they have programs for controlling uh methane and under epa's rules or the federal guidelines or rules we have two sets of standards we have a set of standards for new sources right new source performance standards and then we had a, a set of standards for existing sources. And here, I think the thinking, there's a lot of different uh, views on this, but the thinking is that the new regs are not affecting new source performance standards. The president did not roll back those standards at all. This is all about existing sources. Mm -hmm. And within, and, and there are two reasons for this. One is, in most cases, the states are already controlling. They have their own set of rules for existing sources. And second, under the way regulation for pollutants that you like, or criteria pollutants are used in the United States, there is concern that if you were to use, uh, go after existing sources for which we don't have a very traditional way of controlling methane, and we usually go after something called vol volatile organic compounds and uh, what happens is that it can be a stalking horse to shut down fossil fuels if a next administration comes along because they can say look we don't really have to use the traditional criteria we can go after existing sources and say well if uh, you violate this rule under existing sources even though it's kind of problematic whether we have the authority um, you you should, you're going to have to shut down because a large volume of U.S. production, maybe, uh, you know, there are over a million wells in the U.S., but there's a lots and lots of wells run by small mom-pa operations that just produce a few barrels a day or a little bit of gas. And putting a very strict set of regulations on those would shut down that production. Mm -hmm. but I think there is a kind of fear here that those in the new Green Deal and want to shut down fossil production, that this particular regulation could be used to shut down fossil fuel production in the U.S. Probably that's a bit overdone, but it is a, it is a genuine concern that a lot of people have. And the other part of it is you will see a lot of big companies uh, are not against these new rules, but uh, I think here the concern is, well, it's kind of a competitive issue, right? Uh, one way to uh, uh, kind of give the bigger companies a competitive advantage because they have very large operations. They can amortize over a big, uh, a big set of uh, uh, production centers that uh, if you put those same rules on very small operators, it would put them out of business. Mm -hmm. So uh, are the uh, operators, big or small, uh, behind these rule changes? And have they come to the administration asking for these rule changes? I would say that the small operators were very much against, these are Obama, these are regs that were proposed during the Obama administration. They, they saw it as a, as a sort of a, a, a duplicative of what their regulations were at the state level. And a set of regs put them at a high disadvantage because they could not, they didn't have the big kind of, operations and economies of scale of the very large companies mm -hmm. and over time these these small guys are getting bought out and uh, incorporated into the bigger companies is it that the bigger companies uh, have the technology to 
Uh, Absolutely. They, they have the technology, they have the resources, and uh, they have consolidated operations. Mm -hmm. And there were also a lot of other concerns which have, for example, a lot of the operators want to use drones and uh, satellite imagery to detect leaks. And the EPA and the, the regulations did not permit that. They only required they required that leaks be detected through handheld devices, visits by inspectors or visits by, and this is a very costly way to do it. So part of it is how you, how you determine where the leaks are. Mm -hmm. And I think in many of the states, the operators are much more comfortable in working out with the state regulators who are much closer to the operations and they feel do a better job. You know? mm -hmm. Debate about this. Is this really a federal a federal responsibility or not now yeah it's climate it's a global issue yeah okay so let's go to the next chart and see what's going on with the performance here so i think this is an interesting chart and you can see it's gross domestic product and co2 emissions for a seven-year period between 2009 and 2016. and uh you can see here that even though the economy and natural gas grew from uh, you know, uh, actually quite quite uh, remarkably from like 20 uh, you know 20, 20, 24 TCF year to 28 TCF uh, big massive increase in GDP a massive increase in natural gas CO2 emissions declined. And this is uh, really based on the technology getting better at controlling leaks. And that's adjusted for the, you know, the impact of methane. Mm -hmm. And then finally, let's go to the, let's go to the next, uh, the next picture. I think this shows. Uh, most people might think that methane, right, comes from uh, only uh, natural gas or only from petroleum. And this chart here is 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 very interesting. It it divides the uh, sources of methane from those uh, produced by man, and and from natural uh, sources, right? And look here, fossil fuels is about twenty percent, a quarter of that's coal. So if you look at all the sources of methane in the U.S., only about fifteen percent comes from fossil fuels. 30% come from wetlands. 24% uh, from agriculture, right? This is getting people to eat less hamburgers, things like that, you see. Uh, mm -hmm. Biofuel. So it's quite, you sort of wonder, well, why, why, why is everybody focused on just this 15%? Why are not these other areas just as important? But I think the politics of those other areas are much more difficult. Well, you mentioned you before to... that that uh, the methane dissolves more quickly. It uh, it it it, um, it doesn't, it doesn't have stay as... in the atmosphere as long, right? So, but but, but while it it's in the atmosphere, does it have a more profound effect than CO two? Yeah, it has a, it has a greater effect on kind of a, as a green. It's a more potent greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know uh, if you saw this, Lou, but it was about I'd say three weeks ago. Uh, and I think it was on 60 Minutes. It was, a, it was a story of a Russian scientist who had been spending a good part of his life. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, with his son, who was also uh, a scientist, in, uh, above the Arctic Circle uh, and, and in, the, in the permafrost area there, which has mm -hmm. a, you know, a history that can be identified by drilling into the permafrost. Um, right. Anyway, he has, he has found that the permafrost is melting. And as it melts, it releases the gases that have been trapped in it for many, yes. many millennia. Um, and those gases include primarily methane. So what's, what's happening is, according to the scientist, is that as the permafrost melts, there's just large areas of permafrost. I mean, this is a, a lot of territory. Uh, the the um, gradually, the, uh, right now happening, uh, the, the methane's coming up. And, and joining the atmosphere, a big concern. And then, I, and then I heard not too long after that that the same process 
actually exists in other natural you know, formations around the world where we have methane being released, released in, above the Arctic and also below the Arctic from natural processes. And it kind of spins up. It's a, it's a, you know, a cyclical spinning. Uh, the, the release of methane causes more release of methane and so forth. And uh, given that methane is, um, you know, as bad or worse than CO2, at least in the short term, um, this actually accelerates climate change. Have you seen or heard any of, the, any of this? No, no, that's a very common story. I mean, as I said, the climate, <laughs> I, I'm, I guess I'm a lukewarmer, if you're asking me. I'm not a climate denier. I'm a lukewarmer. I, I think, think you're a lukewarmer. Yeah, lukewarmer. I, I, I think we can. I don't think it's the most serious problem facing mankind. I worry that a billion people don't have any electricity at all. I worry about nuclear war. I worry about... Uh, poverty and uh, declining conditions in the inter inner city. But in the political debate that I live in, this seems to be the only problem people are worried about. And I guess I have a lot more confidence that through technology, through the resourcefulness of mankind, we'll be able to deal with this and that we have a lot of time to deal with it. I don't believe we're all going to die in a few mm. years. Actually, we may not have a lot of time to deal with it on this show. So why don't we go to your, your, re, your, your remaining slides. Okay, let's go to, uh, yeah, so let's just go to the last couple of slides here. So first, yes, methane's a problem, but uh, there are lots of other, it's gas, oil and, US oil and gas. If you could get all the sources of methane in the world, we're only 1.4%. Yeah, we should do our part. We can do more. And uh, I think making a big deal out of the Trump rule, which is really a technical issue more than a political one. And then if you go to the next picture, let's we'll kind of whip through these quickly. You can see here all the sources of methane in the U.S. Landfills, natural gas, which we're talking about. Enteric fermentation, that's another name for agriculture. And then finally, go to the very last slide here. I think we'll, uh, we can see, yes, uh, US greenhouse gas emissions, methane's an issue, it's a problem. We need to get better at it, but it's not the only problem and it's not the, it's not the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. And so I guess from a public policy point of view, what I, what I would say is you wanna have a responsible way to control methane, but you want to produce as much natural gas as possible because natural gas is relatively clean and it substitutes for coal. Mm -hmm. And it allows us also to produce LNG, which can be shipped around the world, which also substitutes for coal and heavy fuel. So I'll leave it at that. I just want, you know, we, we talked about the periodic table of elements and the, <laughs> and the combi you know, combination yeah. of elements in methane and natural gas. And it's the, it's the same, you said? Um, it's exactly. Methane is natural gas without lighting a match to it. Okay, uh, but but I'm I'm just remembering, and there's just one thing I just want to get clarified. I'm going to send you I'm going to send you some data on what uh, how to think about it in terms of its 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 potency versus CO2. You know, we've had we've had two dairy controversies here in Hawaii, right? Really, uh, on Kauai, yeah, where Piero Mediar uh, tried to establish a, a dairy. And we, you know, we've lost most of our dairies from you know earlier days, and we have a dairy controversy on the Big Island as well. And one of the issues, I mean, there are many issues of people you know who oppose dairies. I, I, and it's, it's it's interesting that we live in a time where people, activist people, actually oppose dairies. But there you have it. But one of the one of the issues about the dairies is that, that the cows, uh, the cows generate methane. What they their droppings generate methane and methane smells yeah, yeah, yeah. so you have hotels nearby for example that they don't like to smell because it you know it, it, it affects the, the experience of their of their yeah, guests. I, I would imagine it would. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know one of the big producers of methane are termites termites <laughs> termites are huge maybe 10 percent of world uh, methane emissions are termites well, we should we should outlaw termites then eh but I just don't understand. I mean, I understand the smell for the, but are people against dairies because of the methane? 
and they what do they want the children to drink soy milk i'm, I'm not sure you know I, I don't know what to do about that yeah <laughs> I'm not sure there's an easy answer on that. And uh, unfortunately, P Piero Midiar uh, closed his operation recently. So the, yeah. the, the, the dairy that was contemplated in Kauai is no more. Yeah, too bad. Um, anyway, okay, well, this is interesting. So what, what is your, your advice then on the subject? If we like LNG, uh, then we shouldn't worry too much about methane. Is that what it is? No, we should have a responsible program to control uh, natural gas leaks. The, we should always be thinking about costs and benefits. We should not panic about it. It's not the, the end of the world. We can, uh, I think part of the problem is within the political world in the United States, there are lots of people who like natural gas when it was expensive and in very short supply. Now it's very inexpensive and in massive supply. And so certain elements of the environmental community don't like it anymore. And that reflects in what's happening here in, in the political debate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it is, as I've said before many times, and I think the data supports that, it is unrealistic to think that a complex of Canada, the US, and Mexico, which is worth a trillion dollars, which provides enormous benefits and opportunities and comfort to the North American uh, economies is going to go away in 10 years. It's not going to happen. So everyone needs to get very realistic and think about how do we move along the gradient in a responsible manner. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. and what I learned from you today is that it, uh, methane mm -hmm. is a very small percentage of, of the CO2 right. uh, and it's against CO2 and a small percentage of LNG. Um, and also that it's not, it's not only from the U.S. and it's not only from as byproduct of the, of the process, uh, the gas process. It, it comes from other sources, including natural ones. I think it's important yeah, I mean, to keep US, those points in mind. We're, never, we're not going to be big enough to affect global, have a uh, remarkable or an important effect on the global climate. We're just not big enough. Okay. And... Uh, we need China and India, all the Asian countries. Everybody else has to get on board. But maybe, maybe the we technology. are one of the best performers in reducing emissions in the world. Yeah, we are the best performer. Yeah, even with President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there. Thank you so okay. much. Appreciate right. it, Lou, as always. Uh, and I all will right, remember man. that at some point along the way, we'll we'll talk about climate in general. And so yeah, yeah, I'd be happy, bring all these points together. I might have to bring an expert in with me to do that. <laughs> one. I'll bring somebody. Okay. okay. Lou Pulirisi, E. Prink in Washington, joining us. Thank you so much. We'll see you in two weeks, okay. Lou. Okay. Bye bye, Jeff. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Hello.